And via telephone, the vice chair of finance in the West Virginia House of Delegates, John Hardy. Mr. Hardy, good morning to you, sir. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, I believe my wife just filed with our accountant for our extension. <laughs> so uh, our our taxes uh, have to be filed by March 15th. And uh, my wife knew uh, with me uh, spending so much time in Charleston, and she'd go ahead and get out in front of that. And I think she's already filed for our extension. So Yes, don't wait till the last minute. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, John, let's start uh, first and foremost with, uh, I see on the Metro News website, Senate approves pay raise bill for state lawmakers. So uh, has that uh, has that vote already taken place in the House, too? This would, it looks like uh, an independent seven-member Citizens Legislative Compensation Committee recommends lawmakers go from 20000 a year to 30000 a year, plus an increase in per diem. What do you know about this? Uh, yes, I think that's already passed. <laughs> Excuse me. Um I think that's already passed the House. It, I think that was early on in the House that that got passed out. Um, that What it did, is it, gave, it gives that um, commission uh, the ability to sit down and look at uh, legislative pay, uh, pay and pay raises and per diems. I don't think that's been addressed since about 2014, I think, was the last time. And also remember, um, anyone who receives that pay raise will have to get reelected. That won't take effect. Those legally, constitutionally cannot take effect while... We are sitting in office, so anyone that will receive those will have to get reelected to receive those. Yeah, and this also includes uh, kind of a floating rate that moves along with West Virginia's per capita income rate as well. So delegates, senators, pay will be adjusted based on what the uh, per capita income rate is in West Virginia, it looks like, too. Yeah, I'll take your word for that. I'm, I'm not very familiar with that piece of legislation, I'll be honest with you. You're the vice chair of finance, John. <laughs> you know that well. One- yeah, well, I, I've been working on a lot of other projects, so uh, the chairman may have had that and may have been working on that. I've had a lot of other side projects that I've been working on that the chairman has given to me and the majority leader has asked me to look into, so I've been pretty busy with some of the other projects that I've worked on this year. Matt Harvey wants to ask you about uh, locality pay. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say, according to our first guest, that that raise would kick uh, would make a lot of the legislators ineligible for Medicaid if they were so. <laughs> That's true. That was your only job. Well, they'd already be above it at 20000 But, uh, yeah, uh, Delegate Hardy, uh, good morning. W- let's talk about locality pay, and, the res- and there was a recent vote on that in the House. And and I know Delegate – or, excuse me, Senator Barrett is going to try to revive it in the Senate, but t- I know you're – It actually a, passed 33 nothing yesterday. Very good. So I know this is a, a topic that you're very passionate about and you've worked very hard on. So could you could you tell us a little bit about what's going on? Yeah, you're talking about two separate bills. So there was a House bill that was introduced, and forgive me, I don't know the number, but the House bill just basically set up a five, I think it was a five or seven person committee um, that would review um, the state and top five counties or six counties, it was five counties, uh, would take a look at locality pay for those counties. There was absolutely no money in the bill. There was, there was a fund set up, but there was no money allocated to such fund. Uh, and it just basically set up a study process to be able to get the ball rolling um, on locality pay. Uh, House Finance had worked on this for over a year, putting this together. Uh, and unfortunately, we were not able to pass that out of the House. Uh, we fell about nine shorts vote. I think it was a 42. I think it was 42 yays and maybe 50-some nays. Um, a little disappointing that uh, some of my colleagues that uh, you know I have voted for legislation for their areas for economic development, road, water, sewer, uh, coal field enhancement programs and such have uh, have not been able to get on board to, to understand that the issues that the Eastern Panhandle has. Uh, I will tell you the House has become a little territorial in travel this year. Um, uh, it, it's been a really um, uh, an interesting and unique place to do business this year. Uh, I've been a little more frustrated this year than I have in past years. Uh, and trying to work with some of my the, some of the newer colleagues uh, that have come in, and uh, so it's it's been an interesting year. But uh, we got a little closer on it. Senator Barrett has a bill coming over from the Senate that approaches it a little bit differently. It actually will take the agencies and make the agencies uh, promulgate rules to come up with locality pay. Uh, it may be uh, that may be a better approach um, to say, hey, the agencies, you need to study this and we're giving you X amount of time 
to be able to come up with a system in which the agencies can can make this happen. So I think the House bill was the legislature's chance to be able to be involved with this and have more say in this and have a little bit more uh, oversight and and allocating funds for this. And now we're going to give it to the agencies, and the agencies are going to have to come up with a plan. Now the legislature will still have to allocate funds to those agencies, but uh, – We'll see. I don't know if that if the Senate if Jason or Senator Baird's bill will run in the House. I don't know if there's writing on the wall to say, hey, there's really no reason to run that bill. It's not going to pass. Uh, we've seen how things have worked in the House, but uh, we'll we'll just have to talk about it and see how that's going to work. Do you think limiting it to five counties may maybe have uh, you know you've lost some support because it was too exclusive? Well, yeah, people would say it was too narrow, but then if you made it unlimited, people would say, "Wow, this bill goes too far." I mean, we how are we going to manage? You know, so it, you're you got to limit it somewhere, and and uh, you know maybe the bill uh, could have been crafted betterly, uh, better, or maybe the bill was not broad enough, and you, you know it's 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 a work in progress. It's the furthest we've ever gotten on it. Uh, we were able to secure 42 votes. Um, but uh, I guess it's something that we'll continue to work on in interims. We'll continue to work on through this spring and summer and fall and try to craft a piece of legislation where maybe we could pick up a couple more votes. And, uh, and we'll also see how Senator Barrett's legislation fares in the House if it runs. I, I, this is Matt Miller, John. I just I'm I'm blown away when I hear you say that you know that this was a bill not you know, giving extra money, not instituting locality pay, but just to do some research. Here's a committee that's going to study this and look at this, and you can't even get an agreement to go, okay, look, let's at least get the information so that we can work with it and know, is this really needed or not? I mean, that that sounds like a death nail for locality pay. If we won't even study it to look at it, there's no way we're going to go for it. Yeah, I will tell you, like I said earlier, I believe the House has become a little more territorial this year. Uh, there's been a little less compromise, a little bit, I would say, a little bit more fighting between, uh, I don't know if I wouldn't say north versus south, but I would say, uh, you know, and I, and some people like to use the term urban versus uh, rural, but I certainly don't consider Berkeley County urban by any means. But it, it's been, it's just that year, and sometimes that's the flavor of the year. We have a lot of new delegates uh Seems to be a lot of new delegates that have come out of come out of the southern districts, and uh, so so maybe that will soften in the second year of their term, or you know, it, you, you just never really know what the flavor of the legislature is going to be. Well, with that in mind, I understand that after you gave a very impassioned speech about locality pay, that another delegate from down south stepped up and basically said, "Fine, if you want that, then you don't get any coal severance money." You know, um, what, what are your thoughts on on that kind of argument? Which is not a, it's well, not a logical comeback, by the way. The right. two don't equate. Yeah, this, it's it's not apples to apples. It's apples to oranges. And understand, Berkeley County receives. $250,000 in coal severance tax, which is nothing. I mean, I think Berkeley County's budget is around $40 million a year is the county's budget. Um, and it's, and that money comes directly to the county commission and general revenue where we're talking about locality pay, which is pay that comes to uh, state agencies or employees that work for state agencies. So it's not apples to apples. It doesn't really equate. I'm sure that Berkeley County commission would be more than glad to give back our $250,000 if we could get some type of other compensation for our county. Um, you know, at this point, sometimes you say, well, maybe we just build a wall against Morgan County, across Morgan County, and let the Eastern Panhandle do what they need to do and let the rest of the state do what they need to do. It, it Sometimes it becomes very frustrating. I have voted on many, many pieces of legislation to help other areas of West Virginia through economic development, road development, infrastructure development, cutting of taxes on, on the coal industry to be able to open, reopen coal mines, buy new coal equipment, put coal miners back to work. So, I mean, the, the, the projects that I have voted for uh, to support other areas of West Virginia are endless, um, and, and it does become a little frustrating. And I will probably at some point in time, I did give a pretty impassioned speech on the House floor in regards to um, some of the misconceptions of what locality pay would do and would mean. And and how our areas do not compete with any other areas of West Virginia. You know, their concerns of 
people leaving West Virginia to move to the Eastern Panhandle and, and, and explaining that we, we don't compete with any other county in West Virginia. We compete with three of the richest counties in the country, being Fairfax, Loudoun, and Montgomery. Um, so so it's really trying to explain that and, and have them understand that. But at some point in time, I will probably give some type of speech and at least uh, bring light to some of my colleagues on the things that I have voted for and the areas that I have helped in my disappointment in not receiving their support. I would think their philosophy doesn't work if you just look at the reverse, right? There are not people in the Eastern Panhandle who are looking at, say, a teacher's salary and going, heck, I'm moving to this county because for that same amount that I make here, I can get a house for a quarter of the price that I get here. We don't see people flocking to other parts of the state because, quote unquote, that they can have a better quality of living with the same wage. So why would people leave those counties to come here just because there's a little extra money given? In, in a place where you need it because the cost of living is more. Yeah, that's a great analogy, Matt. And like I said, I will tell you, there's a lot of new delegates that have come from the southern areas of the county, of the state. And uh, so, you know, they, they have a point to prove to their uh, constituents that they're not going to, you know, lay down for the what they consider the richest part of the state and, and, and help us in any way. So, like I said, it's just the flavor of the legislature this year. Maybe those... Uh, Feelings will soften uh, in the in in their second year of their term, and and will continue to try to develop legislation um, that will be considered of other people's areas. Uh, can develop legislation in which we can pick up other voters and maybe grow to get that hit that fifty one number. That's the magic number we need to hit. John Hardy, Vice Chair of Finance, is with us on the telephone here from Charleston. Last week of the session is next week. John, the governor yesterday said that he was raising the revenue estimate for the next fiscal year by $850 million. He found $850 million. So that effectively raises your spending cap. Do you have any idea where the $850 million came from? And did you have an inclination that the cap was about to be raised that much? Uh, I think the, the governor was able to go back in and revisit some numbers um, in the budget and some of the numbers that we were hitting uh, also, we're looking at the surpluses. I believe the Friday, the February numbers came in. Uh, I think we're somewhere about 1.2 billion in surplus. Uh, we still got four months to go. Uh, some of that could have been maneuvering those numbers a bit to kind of make the budgets uh, work out. So you, you may see those numbers. Uh, they could be lowered again, or, or it's sometimes those numbers are moved around a bit just to kind of make the when you're working on the final presentation of the budgets to try to make everything come together. So uh, I think that you will see a pretty flat line budget that's going to be introduced. Uh, I know the Senate already got their budget out, which was very flat. Our budget seems to be the same way. Uh, once again, we've controlled spending by putting stuff in the back of the budget, um, uh, controlled some of that spending by putting some of those numbers in the back for uh, agencies and also for projects. So uh, it'll be interesting to get our budget out uh, and see how it compares to the Senate's budget. And then the compromise process between the two chairs uh, will start to – that typically takes about two days for that compromise uh, to kind of work out to get the two budgets to mesh together. Are you confident that there will be some form of a tax cut or rebate program that's enacted for the next uh, – by the time this legislation legislative session ends? Yeah, I'm very confident. I'm, I'm very confident that the, that there will be a tax cut where – uh, it looks like that number that's been landed on was, a, I think it was 21.5, uh, some just a, just a little shade north of 21%. Uh, there was some other cameos in there. There was the uh, the credit for your personal uh, property, which is uh, is a good thing. It is is a good um, it's a good tax savings for West Virginia. It's a bit convoluted. Uh, and I do believe it will grow state government a bit to be able to implement that program. Also, there was a uh, tax cut put in for small businesses, and I believe it was for businesses that had less than a million dollars in assets, so that's a pretty small business. And then there was also the uh, I believe there was a tax cut put in for um, veterans who are 90 to 100 percent disabled, which I believe most counties were already giving the homestead exemption to uh, uh, people who were 100% disabled. So that was another small piece of it. Uh, am I completely happy with the tax plan? No, it's a compromise. 
Uh, I do believe that our Senate colleagues did move the goalposts around on us a bit and, and uh, a little frustrating there. There's some triggers that are in there that is in the bill that I think are maybe a little convoluted on the triggers. Um, the thing that will make me vote for the tax cut is that there is a pathway to zero. I do believe it's a bit of a convoluted path to zero uh, and may need work as uh, the legislation moves forward and out years uh, and as tax collections, um, as revenue estimate or revenues grow, and hopefully we see dynamic growth in the state of people moving to the state, uh, seeing our economic development base grow. So I think it's all going to be a work in progress. Uh, I would have liked to have seen maybe 25 to 30 percent, uh, you know, if we would not have had uh, lost two years working on some of the other tax cuts, you know, the House passed 15 percent cuts two years ago, and we would be a little further down the road, but uh, we seem to have gotten tied up in some uh, other tax plans that did not come to fruition, and now here we are uh, going back to the personal income tax plan and trying to make those numbers work. John, let me ask, uh, we just had uh, Seth DeStefano on with the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. And w when you look at the the, the tax cut and, and trying to even bring the income tax level down to zero, it, he said, you know, that he just doesn't believe that that attracts people, that people are not going to move in specifically because there's no income tax. Because clearly any state that doesn't have an income tax still has to raise taxes in some other way. And so, it kind of offsets. And it sounds like the idea in this legislature right now is by getting it down as much as we can and even eventually down to zero will bring in people. So make the argument on your side that it will actually help and, and people will want to come to West Virginia. Well, first of all, I would remind everyone that that is not a state agency. That is a privately funded organization that is funded heavily by the left. Um, I don't believe anything or any information that they put out. Most of all their information is heavily, heavily skewed. But I would say my argument to that would be as we tend, as we start to cut the personal income taxes, we should definitely see uh, dynamic growth in the state. We should see population growth. We should see uh, businesses, uh, businesses and people moving to the state. I would say that we have controlled spending with flatline budgets. We've controlled the growth of government by about $150 million per year for the past four years. We're running uh, excess uh, surpluses in our revenues due to the, uh, the global strength of energy right now. Coal prices are through the roof, and we know that's cyclical. We, we know that those are going to draw back at some time, and, and we'll lose some of that revenue. But I think that we've done a great job in controlling spending, uh, right size agencies, making agencies work within the footprint that they're given. Uh, and I think that that's the policies that we have put in place in the last four years. And now we're starting to see the benefit from those. And hopefully we can continue to see uh, the, the constituents and our taxpayers see those benefits as we continue to move forward on our uh, plan uh, of trying to move West Virginia forward and by the same time and the same token, controlling spending and controlling our agencies and really trying to have a uh, right-sized government. Yesterday was crossover day. Um, give us an idea of, uh, was it a big load, if you will, that went from one side to the other that's going to really uh, keep you occupied for the next uh, week? It was. It, it very. It was. There was a lot of bills that uh, got out of the House yesterday. Um, you know, we, we call that the... Uh, we were trying to flush all of our committees, getting bills out of the committees in the last past few days. We uh, we worked over the weekend. We're going to work this weekend, taking up Senate legislation. So this is always a very busy time in the House. Uh, uh, and and it's also this <clears throat> this week and, and a few days past, emotions get high and, and people become a bit more animated because they see uh, legislation is starting to die. It's not going to run uh, in the House committees. It's not going to get out of our house. It's not going to be, you know, on the floor. Uh, so that gets a little frustrating in your own house. And then next week, emotions will start to rise as um, people see their bills not running in the Senate. So House members will start to get a bit anxious and Senate bills that will not be running in the House and senators get a little anxious and, 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 and tempers and emotions start to rise again late next week. So it's just part of the 
legislative process. Uh, being my fifth year there, I, I understand the process and I understand how it works. Sometimes it's very hard to take the emotion out of it. Uh, I've I've become you know uh, emotional and, and enraged and and upset a few times myself this year over things that happen, and you just have to take a minute, take a deep breath, and understand it's the process. The process is not easy. It's not designed to be easy, and it's just how it works. So uh, it uh, it really is, uh, you know, this, when we get down to crunch time here, it really becomes a little intense, and there's a lot of things, a lot of moving parts. Dread Matt. Delegate Hardy, um, I know in previous sessions you'd really fought hard to get Berkeley County uh, an additional magistrate, and and right now there's currently two competing uh, judicial redistricting redistricting bills that are on um, that treat this area differently. The Senate's version carves Jefferson County out into its own circuit and adds a magistrate, and the House version leaves Berkeley, Morgan, and Jefferson as a unitary circuit, and and I, I don't believe Jefferson County gets uh, another magistrate. Um, do you have any insight into which bill is more likely to pass? Because we're an outlier here with Jefferson County having 57,000 residents. We don't have our own judicial circuit. Most counties that have – there's some counties that have 20,000 residents and have their own judicial circuit. So it's it just makes it hard for Jefferson County voters to select their judge. Yeah, Matt, and that's, that's a great uh, piece of legislation. That's a great thing to bring up there. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly which one of those is, going, is gaining the most favor. Uh, I'm probably in the camp of probably keeping the circuits together. Uh, I'm not sure that I know that I have enough information uh, on that piece of legislation to give you a detailed answer today. It's something that I uh, have not spent a lot of time on, uh, and it's something that that will be working through the next couple days. Uh, I know that there is definitely a need for another magistrate in Jefferson County. There's definitely a need for at least maybe one or two more magistrates in Berkeley County. Uh, but I don't know if the um, if it's been sold to me for Jefferson County to have its own circuit yet. Well, you call uh, me and talk to me afterwards, and I can I'll I'll be sure to sell it to you. Okay, I'm I'm sure you will. And and I know that we worked on a piece of legislation for you this year for. Uh, I believe it was for the vehicular homeless. Uh, criminal negligence? Reckless, criminal it, negligence. It, it, it turned into a, um, the, the name is the reckless driving resulting in death. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I know, I know that we worked on that. So I would be more than glad to get your input on the, the circuits and how that should be broken down. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, I lean on Paul Espinosa for some of that information. And as everyone knows, being a citizen legislature, there's no way that we can be experts on everything. We handle everything from you know, judicial stuff to bonds to uh, economic development to puberty blockers to, I mean, it's, you just never know what you're going to be, um, ground fault interrupters. I mean, you just never know what you're going to be working on in the West Virginia legislature. And there are times that I just lean on other members to help me understand where I need to be on something because there's just not the time to be able to understand everything in minute um, detail. So, and there are members that come to me and ask for me, my advice on finance stuff, because that's really where I spend my time. John, thanks so much for your time this morning. Any final thoughts? Uh, well, we're down to nine, 10 days here, and hopefully we can uh, hold this thing together and come out of here with a budget, with a, a, a nice flat budget, uh, a nice tax cut for our taxpayers. And, uh, we can uh, come out of here with our heads held high, and hopefully we've done a good job for the people of West Virginia. And uh, if we didn't get it done this year, remember, uh, I'm a longtime Orioles fan. There's always next year. <laughs> I'm a Pirates fan. I feel the same way. Thank you, sir. Thanks, guys. <laughs>